This video covers the tutorial solutions to topic 12, Why Do Stars Shine? These tutorial solutions were recorded by Dr. John T. Horner. Hey folks, welcome to the problem solutions for the 12th lecture in Everyday Physics. These are the astronomy problems. We'll start by talking through question 1. Question 1 is all about the escape velocity from objects. And we're told that the escape velocity, the escape, is equal to the square root of 2 g m divided by r. We're also told that the mass of the Earth is equal to 5.972 times 10 to the 24 kilos. We're told that the radius of the Earth is equal to 6371 kilometers, which is the same as saying 6371 Zero, 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 6.3 million metres. It's always best to have things in metres, kilograms and seconds. And finally we're told that universal gravitational constant is 6.67384 times 10 to the minus 11 and that's in kilogram to the minus 1 seconds to the minus 2 metres cubed. So that's our key information. What we want to do for part A then is to work out the escape velocity from the surface of the Earth. And the question asks for this at the final answer in kilometres per second. So where we start is by taking our equation from above, which is the escape equals square root of 2 g m on r. And we substitute in the r various variables. So go all the way over to here. We get 2 times 6.63. 6.67384 times 10 to the minus 11 times 5.732 times 10 to the 24 divided by the radius, which is in meters, is 6371000. We put that into our calculator. We get the top line equaling 7.9712345 times 10 to the 14. And remember, it's always important to use all of your significant figures until you get through to the very final answer. And that's when you do your rounding. That gets away from rounding errors of uh, 6.3 million, which is the same as saying the square root of 1.25 one one seven four seven seven five seven times ten to the eight which is the same as one 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 eight five point five nine meters per second which is the same as in kilometers per second eleven point one nine kilometers per second to four sig figs. That's our final answer for part one. So it's always worth keeping all of your numbers all the way through until you reach your final answer and then rounding to the correct number of significant figures and always state how many significant figures you've used and always remember to use your units. So that's how we get to the answer for part A. We get the escape velocity for the Earth is 11.19 kilometres per second. How about for part B? I'll just delete the working for part A now to make room. And we can carry on. For part B, we want to work out what the escape velocity would be if we shrank the Earth down and made it just 8 millimetres across. So in this case here, our new radius for the Earth is now 0 0.008 metres. But g and m are still the same. So we can still use our equation that the escape is equal to the square root of 2g m upon r. So if we substitute in, well, the top line of that, 2g m, is just the same as the top line that we worked out in the previous question, because the g and the m are the same. So that will again be our 7.9712345 
times 10 to the 14 that we had on the top line previously. That's just our g multiplied by our mass. But now our radius is much smaller. Our radius is just 0 0.08. So if you put those numbers into your calculator, you now get the escape equals 3.157 times 10 to the 8 meters second. And that's our answer. So again, we've just substituted the numbers in the equation, worked it through, and given our answer to four significant figures. Nice and clear. So, part C asks us whether we would be able to escape from this shrunken Earth, and what kind of object we think that the Earth in this case would have become. So once again, I'll delete what we'd written for part B, and I can delete the equation now because we don't need this. So for this final part of the question, what we want to do is figure out what would happen. Now, we said from part B that with our new tiny Earth, the escape velocity is 3.157 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Meters per second. There we go. However, we know that the speed of light, c, is 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And this is a problem, because what we show here is that the escape velocity for our new tiny Earth is greater than the speed of light. And this is a bad thing. If the escape velocity is greater than the speed of light, we know that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Can travel faster than light. Therefore, nothing could escape. From the mini air. Therefore, Earth has become a black hole. And that's the key point there. The point is, the escape velocity for an Earth that would be shrunk down to 8 millimetres in diameter would become greater than the speed of light. And once, it, once you have to travel faster than the speed of light to escape from an object, nothing could escape, no matter what it was. Not even light could escape. And light's traveling quicker than anything else in the universe. Because not even light can escape, that's why we call an object a black hole. So in this case, we'd say that the Earth has become a black hole. And that's everything you needed to do for question one. So now it's time to look at over question two. And the question here is concerned with our same mad scientist. So having been thwarted in his attempts to meddle with the Earth, he decides instead to shrink the sun down sufficiently far that he turns the sun into a black hole. And the question is asking us what effect this would have on the Earth's orbit around the sun. Now, you have to remember that if the sun was turned into a black hole, there'd be many, many problems the sun would stop shining, so we'd have a lack of light and a lack of heat. The Earth would freeze solid, we wouldn't have any daylight. But that's not really what the question's after. The question's purely interested in how the orbit of the Earth would or wouldn't change. So what we're going to look at following the hints is to try and work out the orbital period of the Earth, given the mass of the sun, given the radius of the Earth's orbit. In order to do this, we have to use the equations that we worked out earlier on in the lecture. So I'll just run you through that derivation again, because I think it's quite a useful place to start. So, we remember that the force due to gravity is equal to the universal gravitational constant times the mass of object 1, which is the Sun, times the mass of the other object, which is the Earth, divided by the square of the distance between the two, the radius of the Earth's orbit. That we can equate to the centripetal force, which is equal to the mass of the Earth, times the radius of the Earth's orbit, times the angular frequency of the Earth's orbit squared. What we also know is that angular frequency is equal to 2 pi times the frequency 
which is the same as saying 2 pi divided by the period. So now we can bring these together to derive the relationship between the radius of the Earth's orbit, the period of the Earth's orbit, and the mass of the Sun. So what I'm going to do is cancel these two m's out here firstly, which gives us a slightly simpler thing to work with. We get g m sun over radius of the Earth squared equals the radius of the Earth times omega squared, and omega squared is 4 pi squared divided by t squared for the Earth. Now we're almost there. We can divide through by the r squared, taking it across here, and then we just need to flip things over. So in fact, it's easier to see this than the other way around. We'll instead multiply this by tf squared to take that over to the other side. We'll multiply by r earth squared to take that across to the other side. We'll divide by g m sun and that'll give us our final equation almost. So doing all of that gives us t earth squared equals 4 pi squared radius of the earth cubed, because we've got the radius squared and the radius here, divided by g m sun. And that's almost our final equation. We'll just take the square root of both sides, which will give us t earth equals square root of 4 pi squared radius of earth cubed divided by g m sun. And that's our final equation. So that's the equation linking the orbital period of the Earth here with the radius of the Earth and the mass of the Sun. And that's the equation we're going to be using here in order to answer question two. So I'll just clear the screen and then I'll go through the maths and we'll work out what the orbital period of the Earth should be using this equation. Now obviously you all have an idea what the orbital period of the Earth is because you know the Earth goes around the Sun once per year. So we have a rough idea what kind of number we should be expecting anyway. But let's actually work it out. We get... Let's work it out. We get that the period of the Earth's orbit equals the square root... This is the equation we got before. Of 4 pi squared radius of Earth's orbit cubed divided by g m sun. And we're told in the question that the mass of the Sun is equal to 1.989 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. We're told that the radius of the Earth's orbit is equal to 149.6 million, so times 10 to the 6 kilometers, which is the same as 149.6 times 10 to the 9 meters, because you have a thousand meters for every kilometer. And finally, we remember that from the previous question, g is 6.67384 kilograms to the minus one seconds to the minus two meters cubed. Make that minus be clearer. So that's all the variables we need. We can now start substituting in. So put us a line there. So if we substitute these in, we get t for the earth equals the square root of 4 pi squared times 149.6 times 10 to the 9 all cubed divided by 6.67384 times 10 to the minus 11. Sorry, G should have here times 10 to the minus 11 in it. Always double check your variables when you're putting them in. Always really important. If I hadn't spotted that mistake, we'd have got an answer very, very different to the one that we're expecting. Now, one of the advantages of knowing what kind of answer you expect is that you can spot when you've made a mistake, but better to pick it up early. So we've got G times the mass of the sun is 1.989 times 10 to the 30 kilos. So if we work this out on a calculator, put the working through, we get that the period for the Earth is equal to 315 five five two seven four point seven seconds that's the answer the calculator gives but we want to round that down to the correct number of significant figures to be more reasonable 
Now, all of the numbers in the question are given to four significant figures, so our final answer here is 3.156 times 10 to the 7 seconds, which is to four significant figures. So that's our final answer there. So that gives us the orbital period for the Earth around the Sun, using the equation that we just derived. Now what we'd like to do here is a quick sanity check, just to check that that number makes sense. Now we know that one year is equal to 365 days. What we can do is work out this time in days and see how that compares. So if we put time in days is equal to 3.156 times 10 to the 7 divided by the number of seconds in a day. 24 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds. If we work this out, we find that our answer for the number of days this takes is 365.2 days. That's the number of seconds the Earth takes to go around the sun divided by the number of seconds in a day gives us the number of days that the Earth takes to go around the sun. Now that's slightly different to the 365 days you typically think of as one year, but that's not actually a bad thing. If we could go to more significant figures and have the numbers right, you see that this is actually roughly a quarter of a day, this term here. And that's the reason that we have an extra day every four years. We have a leap year, because the true length of the year is not exactly 365 days, but is about 365 and a quarter days. And we've just worked that out. So inadvertently, we've proven why the Earth needs leap years. And that's a good sanity check. We've shown that the numbers we've worked out tally with what we expected. And it's always worth doing that. So, we now know the orbital period of the Earth around the Sun, as the Sun is today. What the question is asking is what difference it would make to the Earth's orbit if you changed the physical size of the Sun. So, we have our equation, or we will have our equation. So we have our equation that T, the orbital period for the Earth, is equal to the square root of 4 pi squared radius of the Earth's orbit cubed divided by g times the mass of the Sun. Well, what, now that the guys turned the Sun into a black hole, what of this has changed? The mass of the Sun, well, the mass is still the same before and after. So the mass of the Sun is unchanged. The radius of the Earth's orbit is also unchanged. He's done nothing to the Earth to change it. If the mass hasn't changed, the radius hasn't changed, the universal gravitational constant is still a constant, and pi is still constant. If these things haven't changed, therefore, the period of the Earth's orbit will not have changed. Since the period of the Earth's orbit is purely a function of its radius and the mass of the Sun. So in other words, by turning the Sun into a black hole, the guy hasn't altered the Earth's orbit one bit. In terms of the gravitational pull of the Sun, nothing's changed. He's just shrunk the object down. The mass is the same, so the acceleration is the same. Now, like I say, him doing this nasty thing to the Sun would have many other problems for the Earth, not least of which would be the cessation of solar radiation, the lack of light coming from the Sun, the fact the Earth would freeze. But at least in terms of the Earth's orbit, nothing would have changed. Now to the answer to question three. So question three is mainly based around the understanding. So I'm going to go through the answer to part A probably in more depth than you would need to so that we can fully explain things. So, if you've got two planets orbiting a star, let me try that again. So, question three. If you have two pl a planet orbiting around a star, you actually have the star and the planet orbiting around their common centre of mass. Like this. It's like a seesaw. The star and the planet must balance, so that means that the star follows an orbit of radius r star around that centre of mass, while the planet follows an orbit 
our planet also around that center of mass and the distance from the star to the planet equals the distance of the star from the center of mass plus the distance of the planet from the center of mass. So that allows you to visualize how they're going around. If you increase the mass of the planet by a factor of 10, mass goes up by a factor of 10. Um, then the center of mass will move towards the planet. So all else being equal, radius of star increases by a factor 10. Of 10. So, if you increase the mass of a planet by a factor of 10, the radius of the orbit of the star will increase by a factor of 10. The two are still separated by the same distance, so their orbital period is still the same. So this means that the star is going around a circle 10 times bigger in the same time. Therefore, the velocity of the star goes increases by a factor 10. And that's what we measure with the radial velocity. So if you increase the mass of the planet by a factor of 10, you'll increase the velocity that the star wobbles at by a factor of 10, if the planet's on the same orbit. However, we're not just in this case changing the mass of the planet, we're also changing its distance. So I'll just make a note in the top right that, hang on, I'll just make a note up here that, um, If the mass goes up by 10, velocity up by 10. Now we're going to have a look at what happens if you increase the orbital period of the planet. So again, thinking of our seesaw, we know from Kepler's law that the ratio of the period squared to the radius cubed is the same for two different planets going around a star. So we can say that T1 squared over R1 squared is equal to t2 squared over r2 cubed, sorry, t1 squared over r1 cubed is equal to t2 squared over r2 cubed. Um, so what we know is that t2 in our case is equal to 3 times t1. What does that do to the radius? So what we're working out here is how the radius will change if you keep the mass the same how the velocity will change if you keep the mass the same, but change the radius of the orbit. So we can rearrange this equation here to work out R2. R2 cubed equals R1 cubed times T2 squared divided by T1 squared. And if we substitute in that T2 equals 3T1, this becomes 9T1 squared R1 cubed over t1 squared. We can cancel these, so therefore r2 is equal to the cube root of 3, sorry, cube root of 9 times r1, which is approximately equal to 2.1. So what we do, if you increase the period by 3, you increase r by approximately 2.1. So you've got an object that is going around 2.1 times the distance in three times as long. So therefore you find that the velocity is of order two thirds that it was before, 2.1 over three. So if you have a planet that is three times further from the star than another planet, and they're the same mass, the size of the wobble for the planet that's period, sorry, if you have a planet whose period is three times that of another planet, but they have the same mass, then the wobble that the star does for the object with the period three times as great is two thirds as big. That's the velocity in meters per second here. So what we can do now is combine these two facts. 
because what we have in this question is a case where you have a planet that is 10 times the mass at 3 times the period. So we can say contribution, oh, let me get this here, contribution from mass alone. Let's call our outer planet the outer. Call our massive planet, we should say. I'll erase that and make that clearer. Um, the wobble velocity for the massive planet is equal to 10 times the wobble for the lighter. And in terms of distance, with no mass, the wobble for the outer is equal to approximately two-thirds the velocity for the inner. So if you combine these, if you've got something massive outside, you get an increase of a factor of 10 of the velocity from the mass and two-thirds from the distance. So the massive outer thing will have a velocity of roughly, and this is only rough, 20 divided by 3, which is approximately 6.6 .6 times the inner. So what this means is that the massive distant planet will have the biggest wobble. So, that's a complicated way of talking you through, but hopefully you can see the thinking behind it. You wouldn't need to go into all of that working there for part A, but it is well worth getting your head around it in order to be able to do part B. So what you find is that the magnitude of the velocity for the massive planet on the outside is 6.6 .6 V in a. So, what I'll do is I'll clear the screen now for us to look at B, and I'll just keep a note of that 6.6 .6 times the inner velocity. So what we said was that for part B we know that the amplitude for the big distant planet of big distant equals approximately 6.6 .6 times amplitude of close and light. And we also know that the period of the big distant one is equal to three times the period of the close and light one. 300 days versus 100 days. So between those two bits of information, that allows us to draw, to sketch, the radial velocity contributions for the two planets in scale to one another. So we want to draw our axes first. So I'll go here. go here. That's our time axis and this is a velocity, relative velocity of zero. So we say that the amplitude for the big planet is about six times that of the small one. So let's say the amplitude for the big planet is here, the amplitude for the small planet is going to be about there. That's about a factor of six. So the period for the big planet is three times that of the close one. So if we say that the big planet completes one full period in the time of our graph, then that's how the radial velocity, the velocity here, will vary over time for the big planet. The little planet has to fit three full periods in here. So period 1 will finish here, period 2 will finish here, period 3 will finish here, and the amplitude will stay within this region here. Something like that. So our little planet has a much shorter period, so it does something like, I'll 
work that out because I can't draw freehand awfully well. Always good to have a rubber with you when you've got a drawing pattern like this. So, our, our little planet follows a radial velocity curve something like this. Should be perfectly sinusoidal, but drawing freehand is never the easiest thing. So the important thing here, if we call this planet 1 and this one planet 2, is that the period for planet 2 equals 3 times the period for planet 1, and the amplitude, the max for planet 2 is equal to 6.6 .6 times the max planet 1. So we can see the effects of the mass and also the orbital radius for the curves here. And hopefully that's fairly straightforward. You can see what we need to do there and you now understand how the radial velocity technique for discovering planets results in us being able to work out their masses and their periods. So now we're going to take a look at question four. Question four is looking at the lifetimes of different stars, trying to illustrate the point we made in the lecture that stars with different masses have lifetimes that vary dramatically. So what we've done for this question is pick out some of the most familiar stars in the night sky for the first two parts of the question, and then two stars with which people are less familiar, but which are particularly spectacularly massive or relatively small. And this should give you an idea of the full variety of stellar lifetimes. Where we're going to start, though, is by the relationships we mentioned in the lecture, just to remember the equations. So we said that the brightness of a star, the luminosity, is proportional to the fourth power of the star's mass. That varies a little depending on the mass, but it's a fairly good approximation. The amount of fuel a star has is simply proportional to the mass of the star. And the star comes to the end of its life when it's burned all its fuel. So the lifetime of a star is going to be proportional to the amount of fuel divided by the rate at which it burns the fuel, which is its brightness or luminosity, which therefore means that the lifetime of the star is going to be proportional to 1 over its mass cubed. And that's the relationship that we're going to be using. Now we can turn this into an equality if we know a value of t and a value of m. We can say that the lifetime is equal to a constant we'll call c divided by m cubed. That's turned our proportionality into an equation. We therefore can say that the constant is equal to the product of the time, the lifetime, and the mass cubed. We've just rearranged that three. For the sun, we know that t is 10 billion years, which is 10 to the 10 years. And to keep it simple, we'll work in units of the mass of the sun. So for the sun, the mass is one solar mass. So putting these numbers into this equation, gives us constant equals 10 to the 10. And it does have some units. It have units of years um, times solar masses cubed. So that's our constant. So now we know the constant, we have an equation which we can use to work out these answers. This is going to be really, really useful. So let's plow through here. And so for part A of question 4, we're going to look at the lifetime of the bright star Sirius, which is the brightest star you can see in the night sky. And it's visible in the summer months here. It's already rising and very, very bright in October come 11pm. And every month it rises two hours earlier. So by the middle of summer, you'll be able to see the star very brightly nearly overhead. Now Sirius is a star that's very nearby, which is part of why it looks so bright in the sky. But it's also a fair bit more massive than our sun. In fact, we know from the question that the mass of Sirius is about 2.02 .02 times the mass of our Sun. So in order to work out the lifetime of Sirius, then we have our equation that the lifetime of a star is equal to our constant, which was 10 to the 10, divided by the mass of the star cubed. Now for Sirius, we've said that the mass of Sirius is 2.02 .02 times the mass of the Sun. So therefore the lifetime for Sirius must be equal to 10 to the 10 years divided by 2.02 .02 to the power 3, which if we work that out with our calculator comes out as 1.21 times 10 to the 9 years 
which is equal to 1,210 million years. And that's to a sensible number of significant figures, even if I can't underline properly. The mass of Sirius was given to three significant figures here, so it seems reasonable to give the answer to the question also to three significant figures. Simply by doubling the mass of the star, we've reduced its lifetime by almost a factor of a ten. Part B takes us further down this route. For part B, we're going to look at the bright star called Antares, which is the orange star at the heart of the Scorpion, the star Scorpius, which can, the constellation Scorpius, which can be seen very clearly through the winter months in Australia, almost directly overhead. And if you get out in the winter months under a very dark sky, you can see the Milky Way running through Scorpius right next to the centre of the galaxy. It's really spectacular. Now, Antares is a red supergiant star. It's a star that's much more massive than the Sun and is coming towards the end of its lifetime. What we're told in the question is that the mass of Antares is equal to 12.4 times the mass of the Sun. So we can use this again using our same equation to work out the expected lifetime for Antares. So the lifetime for Antares would be 10 to the 10 years divided by 12.4 to the power 3, which again if we work that through with the calculator comes out as 5.24 times 10 to the 6 years, which is the same as saying 5.24 million years. And once again we're given the mass to 3 sig figs, so the answer is to 3 sig figs here. What this is telling us is that because Antares is so much more massive than the Sun, it'll be equally much short, much more short-lived than the Sun. We've increased the mass by more than a factor of 10, so we've reduced the lifetime by more than a factor of 1,000. Antares is a very short-lived star, and in fact, at some point in the next million years, possibly sooner, Antares will come to the end of its life and explode as a massive supernova explosion, and will temporarily outshine the rest of the galaxy, before dissipating off into space as a supernova remnant. So Antares is going to die very soon and is a good example of a massive short-lived star that you can see very easily with the unaided eye. Now for part C, we're looking at a star that's thought to be the most massive star known. It's highly unstable. It's a star called, with a fabulous name, R136A1. And the mass of this star is thought to be 265 times the mass of the Sun. And that mass is so high that we don't think the star is stable, that it will fall apart very quickly, that it just won't work, won't survive long term. But we can see roughly why if we work out its lifetime. Here we have a lifetime of 10 to the 10 divided by 265 cubed comes out at just 537 years. That's right. If our all the big approximations that we made to derive this equation are true, this star will have a lifetime shorter than a thousand years. Now that's unfeasible, that's a little bit unpredictable. It's showing us where our ideas are breaking down a little bit, but it is highlighting how very, very unstable this star is. So that's a nice example to work with. The final one is to look at the mass of Proxima Centauri. Proxima is the closest star we know of to the Sun, and it's tiny. It's just 0.123 times the Sun's mass. Now, if we put that into our equation, the lifetime for Proxima is equal to 10 to the 10 divided by 0.123 cubed, and that comes out at 5.37 times 10 to the 12 years, which is the same as 5,000 370 billion years. So really low mass stars like Proxima, and Proxima is not unusually small and light, many stars are still smaller. Very small stars will essentially burn forever. They'll burn for a hundred or even a thousand times longer than our Sun. Our Sun for comparison was just 10 billion years. So this Proxima will live for over 500 times longer than our Sun. And that's pretty cool. So anyway, that's our answers for question four. Finished. Hey folks, so for this final question, question five, we're going to learn something about comets. And I'm using the example of a spectacular comet called Comet McNaught, 
that was visible from Australia back in 2007. And it's well worth you having a look if you have some spare time and want to see some pretty pictures. For photographs of Comet McNaught at its best, because it was truly astonishing, truly spectacular. Now, one of the things that happens with the most spectacular comets, quite often we see, well, both very bright comets and the faint ones that are flying past all the time. Quite often we'll see them fall apart, disintegrate before our very eyes, fragment into many pieces. What this question is designed to do is to give you an idea why that happens, to give you some insight into how these objects fall apart. So, what we're looking for then, part A wants you to work out the acceleration due to gravity at the surface of the comet. So the force felt by a given object on the comet will be equal to the mass times the acceleration, will be equal to the acceleration, will be entirely due to the force due to gravity, so therefore we can say that force is mass times acceleration equals gm over r squared. And we can immediately cancel the little m from here with the little m here, which gives us an equation telling us that the acceleration due to gravity equals gm divided by r squared. We know again from before that g equals 6.67384 times 10 to the minus 11 kilograms to the minus 1 seconds to the minus 2 meters cubed. We know that for our comet, the mass, it's very badly constrained. We're only giving it to one significant figure. We're told that the mass is 10 to the 12 kilograms. And we are also told that the radius of the comet is just 5 kilometers. That's of the nucleus of the comet. And that's the same as 5,000 meters. So we should remember here that all of the numbers we've been given except for the universal gravitational constant, are to one significant figure. So our final answer should also be to one significant figure. So our acceleration then is equal to the universal gravitational constant, 6.67384 times 10 to the minus 11, times the mass of the comet, 10 to the 12, divided by the radius squared, which is 5,000 meters squared. If we work that out on a calculator, that gives us 0 0.0000266953 meters per second squared. Now that's to way too many significant figures. We've got no justification in giving six significant figures here when the numbers are given to one. So what we want to say for our final answer is that the acceleration then is equal to 3 times 10 to the minus 6 meters second squared to one significant figure. So in other words, the acceleration that you would feel were you on the surface of this comet is absolutely minuscule. It's just 3 times 10 to the minus 6 meters per second squared. So that tells you something about the gravitational pull of the object, which is small. What part B asks you to do is use the equations we saw at the start of this problem set to work out the escape velocity for the comet. So that's what we're going to do now. We'll work out how fast you have to be moving before you would be would leave the surface of the comet never to return. You'd escape into space. So we can remember from earlier on that our escape velocity formula was equal to the square root of 2g m upon r. So if we substitute in the values we have for g m and r, we get that the escape velocity is equal to 2 times 6.63, my apologies, 6.73, 2 times 6.7384 times 10 to the minus 11 times 10 to the 12 for the mass of the comet divided by 5,000 which is its radius in meters. If we work that out on a calculator, we get that the escape velocity is 0 0.163387 dot dot dot, as many significant figures as your calculator gives you, meters per second, which again to one significant figure is just 0 0.2 meters per second to one sig fig. So in other words, if you were stood on the surface of this comet and you made a snowball and you threw it at just 20 centimetres per second, much slower than walking speed, 
that snowball would fly off into space never to return. It would escape from the comet. So the final part of this question wants you to use the two answers that we just derived, that we just obtained, to talk about why comets fall apart so easily. So let's restate the two answers. Firstly, we have for this particular comet, the escape velocity is approximately 0.2 meters per second, which is 20 centimeters per second. It's very low. We know that the acceleration at the surface is also very low. It's just 3 times 10 to the minus 6 meters per second squared. That's vanishingly small. So this is telling us two things, which are both pretty much linked together. Say so that the low acceleration well that's telling us that the thing is barely held together. Barely held together. By its um, gravity. And that means that the thing will be very fragile. You don't need to give it much of a nudge before it gets disrupted, before it fragments. And also, since the escape velocity is also very low, only a tiny nudge or a push is needed um, for things to escape. What this means is that if anything happens to disrupt the comet, to nudge it, to smash it to pieces, those pieces don't have to be moving apart very quickly before they just disperse, before they're moving faster than the escape velocity, and the comet will fragment and the pieces will float away from each other. And this is what we observe. We observe a comet like a cometary nucleus, something happens to disrupt it, solar radiation comes in, causing material to be flung away from it here, causes the comet to crack open. As soon as you have two halves of the comet which have been broken apart, there's a little bit of activity here as some of the surface boils up, and that gives this part a push in that direction, this part a push in this direction, with very slow velocities, but those very slow velocities are greater than the escape velocity and so these pieces drift away into space and separate and the comet has fragmented. Sometimes comets fragment into just two or three pieces, other times they fall apart into many pieces or just totally disappear from view. If you wanted a couple of examples to look at for further reading if you find this interesting, two good examples that you could look at, let me just delete this and I'll give you the names. For more, you might want to look at the story of Comet Beeler, which is now a dead comet, which is the parent of a meteor shower that used to be seen called the Andromedids, or Andromedids actually, I think. There it is. That's one very famous example of a comet splitting. There's also Comet West, which was very spectacular back in the 1970s, or the comet that hit Jupiter back in 1994, Comet Schumacher-Levy 9. All of these comets broke apart for different reasons. Comet Schumacher-Levy 9 was torn apart by the gravity of Jupiter, whereas comets West and Beeler fell apart as a result of the heating of the Sun. The sun-grazing comets are also comets that fall apart due to the extreme gravitational pull as they swing very close to the sun. 
So comets fall apart very often, and that quite frequently causes them to become very bright, very spectacular at the same time. And hopefully by working through question five, you'll understand now why comets are such fragile, tenuous objects.